Happy Sabbath. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll be sharing um, some of the things we um, experienced in GYC. Um, Rachel, Alvis, and I. Um, before we start, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, our Lord in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for making it possible that we are all here to worship you. Lord, as we share our experiences at GYC, help us come and speak to us. Help us not to only be the hearers of your word, but also the doers of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so I will start with, um, I mean, pardon me, I wrote down everything I wanted to say here, and um, yeah. So I will start with um, what actually inspired me about GYC. Um, what actually inspired me about GYC. There were, there were a lot of things that inspired me, but um, I only um, highlighted about four main things that I learned from GYC. And one of, uh, number one is the passionate worship of young people. Like we earlier said, we had over 4,000 people that attended GYC. And from my own um, statistics, over 85% of those that came to GYC were young people. But not just young people. I witnessed thousands of young people coming together with enthusiasm and sincerity to worship God, which was really, really amazing to me. Um, the second thing here is um, the fellowship and community. So I said here, GYC provided a platform for young Christians to connect, build friendship, and share experiences, which is exactly what we um, experienced at GYC. The sense of community fostered at the GYC conference can be uplifting and encouraging, especially for those seeking like-minded peers on their spiritual journey. So, um, during fellowship, I mean, like, like we earlier said, we had a lot of um, you know um, things we did, and um, there are two things that really um, that was really um, you know um, that amazed me. The number one was the seminars, the seminar um, you know that we attended. So for me, um, like Elvis said, um, there were. I mean, if you are into you know, sp um, something that has to do with um, spirituality and other things. Um, but for me, I was opportune to attend one of the seminars, which was on relationship. So um, there was this couple that talked about relationship. You know, they shared their own experience, how they were, um, how they were able to you know, overcome a lot of, um, you know, um, problems in, in their marriage, which was something that, um, that was very good to me. The next thing here is the prayer emphasis. GYC places a strong emphasis on prayer, recognizing it as a vital aspect of Christian life. The collective prayer seasons that we had at GYC the prayer walks and prayer vigils during the conference cultivate a spirit of dependence on God and a commitment to seeking his guidance and intervention. And the last thing that I could get from what inspired me about GYC was the mission and service opportunities. GYC aspires attendees to actively engage in mission work and service projects. Like um, uh, we earlier said, you know, some people we are, you know, volunteers, you know, in building some beds for children, and, you know, for the homeless people, you know, both locally and globally. Learning about various outreach init initiatives and hearing testimonies of lives transformed through acts of service motivates young people to become agents of positive change in their communities. So 
one more thing I, 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 um, I wanted to say is this. Um, during the GYC, we had this theme, but if not. So what touched me about the but if not theme? As you can see, I'm wearing the, um, the shirt, and it's boldly written here, the but if not. The but if not theme carries a powerful message of unwavering faith and trust in God, even in the face of adversity and uncertainty. And the mem memory text for our team was taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 18. Daniel, chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We all know the story about um, Nebuchadnezzar and the, um, with um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So here I said something, that in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar commanded all to worship a golden image, which we all know already. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were faithful to God, refused. They were threatened with death you know, in, in a burning fire, and they proclaimed, but if not, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image. Now, what can we gather from this? Their unwavering faith defied the king's degree. Bound and cast into the flames, they emerged unharmed, accompanied by a fourth figure. I mean, we all know the story, a divine presence. Their bold stand shows their trust and God's sovereignty, even when outcomes were uncertain. So the but if not team talked about faith, faith as Christians, faith as um, believers of God. So wh what does this inspire us to do as Christians? You know, having faith as Christians, what does it inspire us to do? For me, it makes me understand to the reality that sometimes God's deliverance may not come in the way or timing we expect or desire. But our faith should always remain steadfast regardless. That's my own take. So ask yourself this question. What does this inspire you to do as Christians? Now, here is what specifically touched me about the but if not steam. Number one, resolute trust. The but if not team reflects a resolute trust in God's sovereignty and wisdom. Acknowledging that if God chooses not to intervene in the way we hope, he is still in control and worthy of our faith and obedience. This is something that we should take home today. Because I know that sometimes um, you can want something to be done immediately, and then you will not get that, and then you start having doubts that, you know, whether God exists or why is God not answering my prayers. Just like um, during the Sabbath school, some people shared, you know, testimonies about this. But you should know that God is still in control and worthy of our faith and obedience. This unwavering trust in God's character and purpose, regardless of outcomes, is both challenging and deep inspiring. Another thing that touched me about the team was the courage in adversity. We know the story about um, Nebuchadnezzar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even with Daniel. They are trusting God. And here I said, the but if not, Mentality embodies courage and resilience in the, face of, in the face of adversity. It acknowledges that even in times of trials and suffering, our faith remains anchored in God's goodness and faithfulness. This courage to stand firm in the midst of adversity, knowing that God is with us and will sustain us. It's a statement of the strength of our relationship with him. Courage in adversity. 
The final thing that really touched me about the but if not team is submission to God's will. And here I said something. The but if not team reflects a posture of submission to God's will, even when it diverges from our own desires and expectations. It reminds, of, it reminds us that true faith involves surrendering our plans and preferences to God, trusting that his plans are ultimately for our good and his growth. And now, for the young people here, I have something for you guys. I want you to know something. Your worth isn't measured by worldly standards, but by the love of God. Embrace your unique gifts and purpose. In life's trials, cling to faith. Why? Why must you cling to faith? Because faith is the ultimate anchor. You should always have faith in God, no matter what. Seek wisdom in God's word, and for, for it lies your path. You should always seek wisdom. Don't believe in your own wisdom. Seek wisdom from God. Cultivate a heart of compassion, serving others as Christ, as Christ did. In, in your local churches, you should always try to serve because that way it helps you to, you know, draw you closer to God. Don't fear failure. Don't. It is a stepping stone to growth. Surround yourself with positive influences. Today in our world, we have a lot of negative influences, a lot of negative things out there. Try as much as possible to surround yourself with positive things. You know, positive friends, okay? Surround yourself with positive influences, nurturing your spirit. And above all, know that you are never alone. God walks beside you, guiding and empowering you. Trust his plan for you, for in him you will find strength, hope, and everlasting joy. I do hope uh, my message today have touched someone here today. May you all remain blessed in Jesus' name. Sorry, I have a very small limp. I think someone bashed me while I was sleeping. Um, I don't know who yet. I suspect it's Andrew, but let's see how I go. Um, I just have 10 minutes to spend with you guys. And... Um, Standing on existing protocol, um, um, I still remember vividly the, the, especially the summons for me at GYC. It was um, a wonderful experience. Um, there is this because I, I love listening to black preachers, and a black preacher is not necessarily someone of black color. It's the way they preach, like someone who I think um, Pastor Gary is very close to a black preacher, but. It's the wrong color. <laughs> um, so it was a wonderful experience standing before this guy and listening to the sermon about the three Hebrew young lads who, who um, exhibited what we would look back today and say, but if not. And while I was listening to that sermon, um, something that happened in my life came to, came to my mind. Um, uh, is this is recorded here? Yeah. Okay, my dad is too old to watch YouTube, so it doesn't matter. Um, so I remember, um, I, so my parents weren't always of, so when I was much younger, um, maybe 15, 16 years, just while I was in, um, after high school, I started a ministry, a music ministry, where I played the violin, went around the country concertizing and um, while I was still doing that, I was still in medical school. So my parents did not approve of it. They, they thought it would distract me. They thought it would um, make me fail my exams. Um, medical school in itself is hard enough. Adding a full repertoire of concerts that you have to go to. Sometimes you fly, you travel like 
almost the whole day. They were like, no, nah, you're not supposed to be doing this. And because of that, I decided not to tell them when I was. And I lived very far away from home, and my uni was far, far away from home too. Um, so they didn't have to know. But sometimes their friends tell them, oh, we saw your son somewhere. He plays such a wonderful music. And like, hello, did you go to Abuja? I'm like, oh, who told them? Um, but then everybody knew, everybody knew that my parents didn't approve, at least I knew and everybody who knew me knew that my parents didn't approve of my travel. But one of the travels I remember very vividly, it's a bit graphic, um, no children is here, yeah. So um, I remember this day, I went for a concert, it went very well, it was a big one and um, everybody accepted the, it was a wonderful concert and we're like, whoa, this guy, I used to be the only guy who knew how to play the violin in, in Adventist church back in the day. So a lot of people were excited about the instrument, not necessarily about the music, but the music was good too. Um, so it was very successful. And I would do that on weekends. On Friday, before, before anybody knows, I sneak out of med school, and I'll come back on Sunday evening. So this was in a state nearby, so I just snuck out, went my violin, and everything went well, and it was, Sunday evening. Um, people who know Nigeria know that traveling itself, one of the problems with traveling is, in fact, if you traveled, you are obliged to call the person you left his house to say, I arrived safely. And that is because chances are you wouldn't. Um, accidents happen on the road. Um, and we put it this way, if you're stupid enough to, to drive more than 100 and hit yourself, that's good riddance or bad nonsense. Um, we, we don't necessarily have um, road rules. We, we have them, but nobody enforces them. So it means people could drink and they drive and people don't come back home. So that's what I would have to go through if I was going for concerts. So I remember that day, I, I, I couldn't find a bus that was coming back to my, to my school. And we were already running late, it was late, it was dark. And I found this bus. I was just there. I was like, oh, God, just let me, get me through home. So, because I had an exam the next day. If I miss that bus, not only would I piss myself off, I would, my parents are not going to be happy because I would have missed an exam. And I missed it because I went to play violin, which they told me not to play. But I, I, was, I was quite assured that this is what God wanted me to. This is a ministry he's given me. And I've had a lot of experiences that assures me that, yes, that's what God wanted me to do. And I remember that day, I was seated in front, in the front, in the front seat. And it's not like here, the front seat is, um, so when the cars come over to Nigeria, like when you import cars back to Nigeria, if it's gonna be used for transport, they kind of um, re-engineer them to have more seats than they usually have, so you can pack more people. That means you make good business. So we were, I think, three of us in front. And of course, no seat belts, they don't work. Um, I was seated in front, and I had my violin. I always had it with me on my lap. And there would be these hawkers coming in and say, hey, do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy that? And it's, it's just a beehive of things. So I remember trying to buy a banana, because I love bananas. Um, don't, get, don't get ideas. Um, I love bananas. So I, I started, I, I, I tried to buy them. And then I heard this voice telling me, you're not going to eat them. Um, that was weird for me, I was like, what do you mean I'm, I'm, you're not gonna eat them? This is me having a conversation in my head, like this is a voice, I, I could feel that, that this was not me saying things because there was no reason why I would buy a banana that I love and tell myself I wouldn't want to eat them. And then, I love peanuts too, we call them ground nuts. So I saw ground nut, I bought one, and then the voice said again, I said you're not gonna eat them, so you're just wasting your money. So I was like, okay, so what's gonna happen? So I remember conversing, this is vivid, I can still remember it vividly. And it was like, so you're out here, going out of your way, you probably get just paid enough to pay for your transport and probably support the ministry in a little way. You put all your money in, here, in this, you put all your time just for God. To what, to what end? Why are you doing all of this? How does it, why wouldn't you, this is Saturday night, Friday night, you could hang out with friends and have some fun. What's wrong with you? What is, and I was like, 
why are you asking me all these questions? This is something I've decided I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it against everybody's, um, everybody's uh, opinion. And I feel like that's what God wanted me to do. I, back in the day, I used to see it as, because I was thinking I was going to practice as a doctor. So medicine was my service to humanity, and music was my service to God. So it was like a whole cross to me, and that's how I, how I thought about it. So the voice kept telling me, OK, what, what if you die? What if, you, what if the car crashes and you die on your way coming back from, from school, from a concert to school? And then it, it, it really hit me like, I hope this is not true. I hope I'm not about to die. And th this question asked again, like, what if that happened? And I told him, oh, this would be a good time to die because the next thing I would know is that I would see Jesus and I would be doing something that he would have wanted me to do while I was, uh, while I was um, alive. And good thing, when you die, you don't know anything, so I'm not going to feel the pain. And then after that, that was it. And then I got my, my banana and my, ground, my peanuts, and then there was this other lady who was supposed to sit because I'm the guy, I'm supposed to sit close to the door. And then the car left off. And in the middle of the, 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 the transportation, when everything is now good, everything was going, I tried to bring out my peanut and my banana to, to have some lunch before I get to school because I have to prepare for my exams. All I could remember is that there was this head-on collision we had with some other guy who, it was at night, it was dark, so the guy didn't have any headlights on, he was just going and it was just in a corner, and boom, it was, I remember we, I was in front, so of course no seat belts, the car didn't have one. I, I flew off the, probably broke through the glass, I flew off and hit, in the, hit somewhere in the, in the bush or something. It was a whole lot of things, I, and to me I was like, oh, so this is when I die. It, it just, my life flashed before my eyes, and that was all I remember. And when everything happened, because of course, I think one person died. I don't remember clearly, but I know that we were in the bush and there was nothing. Of course, there's no ambulances. Of course, there was no light. Our car was upside down. We've tumbled many times. Nobody was counting. And it was at that moment that, because I now got myself and I realized that I was alive, that I asked myself, what has just happened? Was God trying to find out or was God testing my faith? Or did I need to know, was God trying to put me through a, a situation where I would realize what he's doing with me? I remember coming back the day after, just so I can see the sights, because it looked to me as a dream. I only sprayed my, an sprayed my ankle, and I was beginning to think, hey, all this happened in my head. So I decided to go back to the scene to see if all of this was real. And then I got there and people were, of course our car was upside down, it was real. And there was this old woman who was, um, who was crying. And I asked her what, what happened here? Just because I wanted to tell myself like this is not happening in my head. And she said, there was an accident here last night and a lot of, uh, some people died. But there was this boy, he, he's not very sure if he, if he survived. That there was uh, blood all over his head and his briefcase, he had a funny briefcase, which was long, and he just walked, walked off, he hoped that. Because at that point, I was like, I have to get to school. So I found the, the latest, um, the, a bike, like a bike. Um, we have motorcycle riders who do that for, for commercial purposes. And then he took me to, to the closest park and I was able to get to school. I, of course, I graduated as a medical doctor and that means I passed. Um, but all this experience, while I think about it now, was, um, was my but if not experience. The times we prepare for war, it's not during war, we prepare for war during times of peace. And as young people, and as, because I've, I've, I think I'm still young, it is, when, it is at these times that you would build what would guide you through, through life. Getting to adulthood, things are gonna be a bit different, things are gonna be a little bit stressful. And sometimes you would doubt even if God is with you. But it's these personal experiences you've had with God that will make it very difficult for you to distrust him. 
Because I've been in situations where I think, I was thinking, what's happening? Is God still with me? Maybe God is not real. Maybe it was all made up. Or maybe we are supposed to be atheists. But then, I remember my experiences, one of, one of which is this. And I asked my, myself the question, so what was that? What are the chances that this would happen randomly? So as young people here, I'm, 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 telling, I'm trying to speak to everyone to remember that while we are still young, this is the time you would build your relationship with God. This is the time you would spend time with him. This is the time you would have tangible reasons to hold on to him. Because later you would fall back to these times and, ask and tell people and share a testimony just like I'm sharing mine and say, yes, of the truth, God was with me. And I pray that we as the three Hebrew guys who would have before that time had a personal relationship with God, have so much that they would be like, we are going to trust God even if he doesn't save us. And so that if we are going through our own crucibles or through our own fire furnace, we'll come out victorious. Thank you. So according to the time, I only have about five minutes, but I know that that is likely impossible. So I do apologize if we do run over time here. But um, it's so lovely to hear from Elvis and Akeli, and I'm so glad that they came with me for this experience. Um, as you heard in the interview, my, GY, my GYC experience was better than I could have imagined. Um, there's just something so special about being in a room with thousands of other youth who share the same beliefs and values as you and like just worshipping together. Spending Sabbath that day was like just the most incredible Sabbath. Um, just reading God's word, being with other people, you know, making new friends, um, listening to incredible sermons. Um, it was just something that I will always remember for the rest of my life. But um, during the week, we had so many speakers I'm just going to read out some of their names. I don't know if any of them are familiar to, familiar to you. But we had Jermaine Gale, who I think is from the Michigan Conference or somewhere like that. We had Adam Ramdin, who is um, the executive producer of the Lineage series that some of you may have seen. Um, we had Mark Howard and we had Sam Walters. And Sam Walters, I believe he is a paediatrician pharmacist from the UK. And he was doing the evening sessions there. And I had never heard of him before, but he was remarkable in the messages that he shared about um, Daniel 3 specifically and the theme of but if not. Um, so there were so many training sessions and workshops and, you know, on various topics, um, but it was really the evening messages from Sam Walters that really highlighted the but if not theme. Um, and as a Kelly and Elvis have talked about the but if not theme is centered around three Hebrew men. I was about to call them boys, but I think they were young men. And they were literally probably my age, um, you know, in their early 20s um, at the time of, you know, being placed in this fiery furnace. So ultimately, I learned that the whole but if not theme, it goes completely against our own society and culture today. Um, it's just 180 degrees from what we are currently living in. And I think as young Christians as well, um, being you know, a young Seventh-day Adventist in this world, the but if not prayer, um, if it's found in Daniel 3, um, verse 18, it's not a prayer. But if you take that and apply that in your prayer life, it's, it will open up doors that you will never see um, open up. Because God's hand, when you pray the but if not prayer, it is, that is the highest form of faith that God wants you to reach. Um, but from Sam's messages, he pointed out three really important um, things that the Hebrew men face. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, there, there were really three important key things that happened. So when they were faced in the fiery furnace, so you can read this in Daniel 3, and the fiery furnace takes place in verse, verses 8. Um, so you can see that when they were faced with this, so the whole kingdom, Neb King Nebuchadnezzar had established this massive idol of himself, this, this massive statue, and he basically ordered everyone in the kingdom to bow down, to worship him as their God, and if you don't bow down, then you will be thrown into this fiery furnace. 
Um, and it was only these three Hebrew men that chose to stand and stay and, and stay true to their one God. Um, and what amazes me, though, is that you know they were obviously taken as captive from Babylon, but they would have they would have known so many other people that that came from their homeland as well. There would have been other Jews as well amongst the crowd that would have bowed down. And it would have been shocking to see, even as a young person today, you know, we might see so many of our friends bow down to these other idols or, you know, leave the church, leave their faith and, and um, you know, worship other things in our lives. And it's so sad to see that if we are the only ones who are standing up. Um, so... As you can see in Daniel chapter 3, from verses 8, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, no, we know the one true living God. We will stand. We will not bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's image. But the one thing that they did do is they remembered. And I have this sentence here from Prophets and Kings. So it says here that they relied on God in the hour of their trial. They remembered the promise of Isaiah 43 2, which says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So they remembered God's promise. And they also remembered their father's teachings of Obeying God leads to deliverance. Not obeying God, that leads to destruction and death. So they held their, this promise in their mind and they remembered. And it makes me realise is that when we are faced with our own fiery furnaces, how often do we not remember God's deliverance in our lives? He has brought you to this and to this and to this. But if I'm faced with a fiery furnace, that is all my attention here. I seem to forget everything that God has led me through if I'm just facing the fears of this furnace. So when you are faced in a trial, especially the youth, remember what God has done in your life. Remember all the past trials that he has delivered you from and put that in the front of your mind instead. The other thing that happened is they waited. So they waited for God's deliverance. So when everyone else was bowing down to this image and they declared their allegiance to God by standing, they waited. God did not deliver them in that moment. Even when they were taken by the soldiers of King Nebuchadnezzar and they were put in front of him and they had to you know, say why they did not want to bow down, God still didn't deliver them at that point. He did not, you know, I don't know, he did not take away the... the um, He did not take away King Nebuchadnezzar or the people that took them as guards. He did not come at that moment. Even when they were being carried into the furnace, God still was not delivering them at that point. And also, it comes to me to remember that when you are facing your own trials, sometimes God will not show up until you are right there in the furnace. Sometimes you might not see him in your trials and tribulations until you're actually right smack bang in the middle of it. And it wasn't until, yeah, they were thrown into the furnace that Jesus was there with them and they were left untouched. They were not harmed. They were not consumed by the fire. And then the third thing that's really important here is they actually increased in faith as they declared their allegiance to God and they did not bow down. There's another part from Prophets and Kings that says their faith strengthened as they declared that God would be glorified by delivering them and with with triumphant assurance born of implicit trust in God, they added, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Those were the three things that they did. They remembered, they waited, and they increased in faith. And I think those three things are so applicable to us as well. But in the messages that I heard at GYC, one of the things that we were asked in the evening programs was, what are you planning to do? And it wasn't in that immediate moment. It's not about, you know, what I'm planning to do this Saturday night or 
what I'm planning to do, you know, in my holiday break. It wasn't about those sorts of plans, but it's what are you planning to do after you've been to all the training seminars, after you've heard all the messages, after you've been to all the outreach programs, what is, it, what is your plan after that? What are you planning to do? We can go to all of these evangelistic things. I can go all the way to GYC, but if I don't have a plan, then what is the point of that? If we commit our plan to God, he will establish our steps. So often from these programs, and I've been to many of these sorts of, you know, similar GYC type events in Australia, often you go to those sorts of things and you get this real spiritual high. And I feel like we did feel that. We got this real, you know, spiritual high, this boost of energy that, yes, we've been, you know, we've spent a few days with thousands of other Seventh-day Adventists and it was great. It was such a huge blessing. But the minute you get home, I think that's where it really starts. That's where you're really tested about, okay, are you actually going to read the Bible every day like you did at GYC? Are you going to keep coming to church like you did at GYC? Are you going to keep, you know, connecting with other believers, being part of the programs, still committing to a faithful relationship to God like you did at GYC? Are you going to be that same person? And often it does feel different. Sometimes, you know, when I got back from home, I was like, wow, you know, Brighton Church, you know, and GYC, there's a bit of a difference there, but it's not our feelings that should dictate our decisions. It's not our feelings that should dictate um, our faithfulness, our attitude to prayer. We should be faithful no matter what we feel, whether we have that spiritual high or whether we don't. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was going to be crucified, he prayed in the spirit of but if not. He fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, remove this cup from me. But he still prayed for his father's will to be done. He did not, his feelings were not in tune with what, what he what, with what he was about to do, dying on the cross in the most brutal way possible. His feelings, they were not aligned with what he was about to do, but he still did it anyway because he wanted to do the Father's will. But it also gets my mind thinking, what does the devil try to do when he wants to give, us, when he wants to give up our faith? when he tries to get us to give up our faith, like he did to Daniel, to Shadrach, to Meshach, and Abednego, how does he try to make us bow down and worship another God? He tries to wear us down and he tries to get us to reach our breaking point. And the question I have specifically for the youth is, are you being worn down? In the book of Daniel, the devil tries to wear down Daniel and his friends in four different settings. He does it in the college. So in the first chapter of Daniel, you can read that they were endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, taught to stand in the king's palace and to teach literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So they were put in the best schools. They were taught the best things and it gets me to think about our youth today. We are put into these great universities, these great learning opportunities and educational programs. But just take note, what, what is the devil trying to do to you in those situations? Is he trying to tear you down and question your faith when you're being taught things at university or in your schools? But he also tried to wear them down in the kitchen. They were presented with unclean food at the king's table. But this was not just ordinary food, this was palace food, the best food you could ever imagine. It was placed right in front of their noses and I'm sure they were tempted. But still, they chose to stand firm and they did not defile themselves. And it comes to us again, sometimes we are placed with the most delicious things, so good, right in front of us. Are we tempted? Yes, we probably are tempted to indulge in those things, but should we? No. 
Satan also tried to wear them down in the palace when it came time for Daniel to tell, tell King Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. Really, he was at the stake of being put to death if he could not do it. And then Satan also tried to wear them down in the kingdom, finally, bowing down before this image. If you don't do this, you will be put to death by fire. But before we can say, but if not, we must recognize what we are not. We should always try and stop telling God how he should work, when he should do it. God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace because he had further work for them to do. And God's deliverance for us is for us to further glorify and serve him. And have you ever prayed the prayer, God, if you would just do this, or if you would just give me this opportunity, God, if you would just give me this job, or if you would just allow me to find, you know, someone I find like we often pray those prayers more than we pray the but if not prayers. And we love the God of verse 17. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. We love the God in verse 17. Sometimes you might ask your boss if you... You know, if you're able to take a day off from Sabbath, if you, can't, if you don't want to work on that Sabbath because you want to go to church, and they say, yes, sure, take Sabbath off, that's fine. And you think, yes, great, thank you, God. Now I don't have to look for a different job. Or if you take an exam and you get the results that you need to, to pass, yes, thank you, God, for delivering me from that. Or if you pray for healing for, for a certain illness, And you pray, God, please heal me from this. And he does. Yes, God, thank you for delivering me from that. We love that God. But verse 18 says, but if not. What happens then? What happens when your boss doesn't let you take Sabbath off? What happens when you do the exam, you've studied for it, but you don't get the results that you need and you fail? What happens when God doesn't actually heal you? Or God doesn't give you what you've been praying for for years? What happens at that point? In Sabbath school this morning, our youth class was talking about, you know, if you're facing all, this, all these trials and you just, it seems like life is just giving you one bad thing after another and you just, you're just living in this constant tribulation you know, what happens to your faith then? What if, you're, what if you've been a believer your whole life, but you just can't seem to get out of this mess that you're in? What happens then? But the but if not prayer, that stuttering that but if not in your prayers, I think that is the highest form of our faith that God wants us to teach. It's the firmest, it's the strongest point of our faith that we can pray. Don't follow God because of how he blesses you and then you lose your faith when the blessings go, but follow God because he is the king of kings, he is the Lord of lords, and he is the only God. There is none other like him and he will deliver you. He will sustain you. And I will call on the worship team to please make their way forward because there is one more thing that I want to share and it's probably the most important thing that I have learned from GYC. And it's honestly the real reason why I think God led me to be at GYC last year. At the end of the entire program, the the entire service, there was a final charge that the presenters committed to all the attendees. And it was essentially pick one person, well, not pick, but pray to God and allow him to put one person's name in your heart that you will pray for, for the entire year. It doesn't have to be a family member, it doesn't even have to be anyone that you're closely associated with, but pick one person in your life that you can pray for, that you can invest in, and that you can pour out to God over every single day. This person doesn't have to be a believer, this person doesn't have to be at church, it could be someone at work, 
It could be a long lost friend that you haven't had contact with in years, but pick one person. And that's what we were tasked to do at the GYC. And I prayed about it. And I'm still praying about this person. And I still haven't seen the fruits of my prayers yet. I've been praying for this person to come back to church, to reply to my messages. You know, this happened in December last year and still I haven't received any hope. And I think what has kept me going is the but if not prayer. I don't know if I'll ever be able to see the fruits of my prayers in this person, but I know that God hears my prayers and I know he will deliver that person at the right time. And I pray, friends, the youth, I know it's hard in this world. Cost of living is crazy and life is hard. We're all faced with challenges, with work. It's, it's a tough world to be in right now. But please hold on to your faith. Continue to pray and pick this one person in your life because you will see God's hand move and he will bless you abundantly, more than you can ever imagine. And I pray, church family, that you may also hang on to this but if not. Pray it in your prayers and live by it, I pray. Thank you. guys for sharing such a powerful message but if not may God help us to hold on to him even though it's really hard but somehow may the Lord strengthen us um, we are singing our last hymn this is my father's word um, let's all right I just want to put a call out to 
any of the youth or any of the parents who have young children, if you are in, interested in attending this year's GYC, please come and see me, Elvis or Akeli. We can show you the information. We can talk to you more about it um, following the service. But please, we highly recommend it. We've had such good experiences of it and you will truly be blessed. Um, so I invite you now to please bow your heads in prayer as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit upon us. I thank you for everyone involved in today's service. I thank you for the message that Elvis and Akeli shared with us, Lord, and the experience that you both gave us from GYC. And I pray that your hand may be over each and every person here in church, especially the young people, Lord, especially those who are facing the fiery furnace, Lord, at this very time. Please help them to stand, help them to stand firm in their faith to you, Lord, to not bow down to other idols, Lord, to not bow down and worship other things in their life or to be discouraged, to be worn down by Satan. Please give them the strength to stand firm, Lord. Please help them, please deliver them, Lord. Help them to pray for you. Help them to pray for that one person that you have placed in their heart and mind. Help them to commit to that person, Lord, to invest in them and to pour out their love over that one person. I pray this all in the name and the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Um, see you next week. Um, before we all disperse, remember there is super buns in the, in the hall. It's a good time to catch up with friends, chat, and um, socialize. Thank you.